Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Our first story we'll be reading today. Karen ruined my $20,000 coat, so I'm suing her. After that, break the law? Sure thing, boss. Sign here, please. And after that, would I be the jerk if I don't allow my daughter to come with the family on vacation? Now for every thumbs up this video gets, one Karen does not get to ruin anyone's $20,000 coat. What about that blazer you wear every day that you got at Goodwill? So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. Karen ruined my $20,000 coat, so I'm suing her. I, 28 female, have a niece who's 16. She's my only sister's only child. Two years ago, I married a very wealthy man who's 34, and because of the lockdown, last Christmas was my first with my in-laws. My mother-in-law gifted me a coat that is worth more than $20,000. I saw her wearing it, asked her where she bought it, and she said that it would be my Christmas gift from her. I didn't know how much it was. I knew it was expensive, but I thought maybe $3,000 at the most. I was visiting my sister last January when my niece saw it. She googled the brand and showed me how much it really was. I won't lie, I didn't wear it after that because I was afraid of ruining it. Last week, I wore it while visiting my sister. While I was putting it back on to leave, I felt something go splat on my back. Then my niece started cackling and the smell of paint hit me. I was so ticked off while she was not apologetic at all. Her mom screamed at her and said she was grounded. Then she said she will pay for the dry cleaning. While I was in my car, still in shock by the way, I got an alert that my niece posted a reel. It was of her doing a prank on me and she said, I'm going to hit my aunt's $20,000 coat with a paint-filled balloon to see how she reacts. I saved it on my phone, sent it to her mom, and told her that a week's grounding is not enough. She didn't reply, but I saw that my niece took it down. It got less than 5 views by then. The next day, I found out my coat cannot be saved, so I called my sister and told her that her daughter has to pay it back. Well, we got into an argument, and she said that they will not be paying it and if I wanted a new one, I should get my husband to buy it for me. I think that they should pay for it. They can afford to. In my opinion, they should sell my niece's car and pay me back my money. We did not reach an agreement, so I told her that I will be suing, and I reminded her that I have video evidence that her daughter, A, did it on purpose for online clout, and B, knew exactly how expensive it was. People in my life are not objective at all. I have some calling me a jerk, some saying that they are the jerks for not buying me a new one, and some so obsessed with the price of the coat that they're calling me a jerk for simply owning it and wanting a new one. So, am I the jerk? Edit. Sorry for not making it clear, but my coat was bought new, just identical to my mother-in-law's. Not the jerk. She ruined a $20,000 coat. She wasn't even apologetic. Not the jerk. This is a really good way for your niece to learn that actions have consequences, and hopefully will serve her well in the future when she's older. And your sister seems to need that lesson too. Sounds like, just have your husband buy you a new one is not an appropriate reaction to your kid destroying a $20,000 item. Honestly, not the jerk. Actions have consequences, and you're right, a week's grounding isn't enough. She should sell her car and cough up the money. The niece is old enough to know better. Tell your sister either she comes up with the money or you take it to the cops. I wonder if a police report will force the insurance company to come up with the money. This wasn't an accident, it was intentional and she won't do it again. This reminds me of the idiots gluing themselves to paintings to fight climate change. $20,000 is an exorbitant amount of money for a jacket. How sad to live in a capitalistic society where we put such high value on one piece of clothing. Maybe these types of things just shouldn't exist. You're the jerk. I won't try to justify her actions. They were clearly wrong and there should be some form of restitution that is made, but suing her is a nuclear option. Think about what you're trading here. You will spend the rest of your life having little to no contact with your only sister and only niece. Holidays, birthdays, graduations, weddings, etc. will all be awkward. That is, if you're even invited. And for what? A piece of fabric? Doesn't seem like a good trade to me. Well, what do you think? Is OP a jerk for wanting to sue her niece or not? Please let us know. Not at all. You can't just let your kid ruin someone's $20,000 item and expect to not have to pay for it. Break the law? Sure thing, boss. Sign here, please. I used to work as a spare parts estimator for a fairly niche industry. 
My job was essentially to work out what parts of our main product the customer wanted, find out how much it would cost us to make, add a little markup, and send them a quote. My boss was pretty strict on traceability, so everything needed to be recorded, including why a certain markup had been applied to a particular product. Normal value of these quotes is somewhere between 200 pounds and a few hundred thousand. Very rarely do we get orders for anything more than that, once or twice a decade in my experience. A request for quotation landed on my desk when I was working from home during lockdown, and it was a biggie. Just looking at the list of parts the customer wanted, this was going to be a giant order, over a million pounds all by itself. I was told by the sales guy that if this one went well, there was another to follow of an even bigger size, ultimately looking at 10 million over the next four years, so I set to work. Normally, I can do five or six of these quotes in a day, but this one quote took me six weeks to put together. I was in constant contact with 20 plus vendors getting specifications, technical details, prices, and lead times for over 400 items. Finally, my masterpiece was complete. Then came the snag. Sales guy then says that because of the country the customer is in, they need to have four or more quotes in from different customers in order to get it cleared by their government, some anti-corruption policy that had been instituted. We were the OEM of the product and there's nowhere else on the planet that they could get these parts from. So we'd have to work through third parties to get it done and he knew just the guy. In walks a one-man band with a dodgy looking entry to save the day. Sales guy and him go way back so he was going to be the preferential supplier. I was asked to do the normal quote to him then to bump the prices up by 30% and send that to three other companies who had been asking about it so they could absolutely not get the contract with the end user. I argued the point, saying that the whole purpose of the anti-corruption policy is to prevent situations exactly like this, but I was overruled. The COO of the company now tells me to just do it over a phone call, at which point I request that in writing, before I go ahead and do it. Fast forward two years and there's still no order that's been placed. Then I find out through a different sales guy that the one-man band has been put on a blacklist by this company's government over this project. The other three companies have been turned down and the end user is asking other companies to come in and take our product out and replace it with their own. A huge investigation is called for by senior management. My quote is ripped to pieces and examined in microscopic detail. And the question gets asked, why did you give different prices to these other three when you knew it was all to do with anti-corruption? We should fire you. That's millions of pounds of order you've lost us. Out comes the email from my little black book. On the desk it goes. Everyone suddenly gets very quiet and the COO starts packing his desk in a box the next week. And the moral of the story is, if someone tells you to do something borderline illegal, make sure to get it in writing. For those asking about the legality of what I did, because all of the third parties were outside of the country where the anti-corruption policy was in place, I didn't personally break any laws. Whilst the anti-corruption policies are in place for the end user, the worst the government can do is put us on a blacklist, so all of our bids in the future are either refused outright or looked at in far more detail than others might be. I did investigate this at the time, and if there were going to be any implications on me that my company wouldn't have been responsible for, it would have been a flat no. I was acting against the intention of the policy, but not expressly breaking it. Do not do something illegal just because your boss told you to. The issue as far as the company was concerned was the lost millions in revenue and the damage to their reputation. The end user is a huge company with contracts and is in a reasonably close-knit industry. People talk. They ultimately wanted a scapegoat to parade in front of the board to explain why the multi-million pound deal they had all been talking about for the last two years had suddenly vanished. I did also look at OEM Angle at the time, but because we aren't the only company who make this type of product, it didn't appear to be possible to use this as an exception, the reasoning being that the option existed to replace our system with the competitors. Would I be the jerk if I don't allow my daughter to come with the family on vacation? I have five kids, three with my first wife, a daughter who's 22, a son who's 16, and a daughter who's 16, and two with my current wife, eight, a son, and six, another son. We are planning a two-week trip to the Dominican Republic in spring of next year. My wife and I are paying for the four youngest, obviously, but as my daughter is an adult with a full-time job, I expected her to pay for her own part of the trip. This is by far the most expensive holiday we've ever been on, and we've been saving up for it for a couple of years. 
She only pays 300 pounds per month for rent and utilities at her mom's house and she didn't have any other large expenses as her car has been paid off for a year. When I told her she would be paying most of her own trip, she initially agreed and didn't have a problem with it. A week ago, I was confirming dates and prices with her before I booked and she decided that she no longer wanted to pay for the trip. I only wanted her to pay 1,400 pounds for the trip, about 600 less than the price per person. I understand it's expensive for a young adult, but she had previously agreed knowing this is what I would expect her to pay and said she was saving for the trip. I also told her she didn't need to pay me all in one go, but that I needed at least 700 pounds from her before I booked the trip and she could pay the rest within a year. I think this is reasonable. I've put off booking the holiday for the time being in the hopes that she'll come around. I've told her that if she doesn't agree to pay, then the rest of the family will go without her and she'll miss out. She thinks it's unfair that she has to pay when I'm paying for the rest of the kids, their children. She pointed out, we never went on a vacation like this when she was still a kid. We mostly did caravan holidays in the UK and France, and I'm therefore giving her siblings experiences she never got. She also says her friend's parents still pay for them to go on holiday with their family. My younger daughter is also upset about the possibility of going without her sister and says it will ruin the holiday for her. My ex-wife also thinks I'm being unreasonable as she agrees with our daughter about her not having the same experiences as the younger kids do because we had less money when she was younger. My daughter's stepdad has offered to pay me the initial 700 pounds, but I feel weird about taking money from him. As an adult, I really think my daughter should take on the responsibility for paying for herself, but would I be the jerk if I don't let her come if she continues to refuse? Edit, I'm paying around 11,000 for this trip, which is roughly a quarter of my yearly income. I wanted my daughter to pay 1,400 pounds, which is maybe 6% of her yearly income. And yes, she does only have minimal expenses. 300 for rent is nothing where we live, and she couldn't rent a bed sit for double the price. A large percentage of her income is disposable, and she saves lots living at home. Bear in mind, I have a mortgage, soaring electric and gas bills, as well as four kids to provide for. She's had nine months to save 700, but didn't even need to because she already had more than 700 saved nine months ago. She now has another year to get me the other 700, and I had no plans about being strict about payback. This summer, she went with friends for a few days to Disneyland Paris. I paid 300 pounds towards this trip as a birthday gift for her. This summer, when we went on a cheap holiday to Cornwall, I paid for all of her expenses then. My daughter helped plan this trip from the start, and we chose almost every aspect as a family, and she knew from the start how much I expected her to cover for this holiday. If she had said this didn't work for her, I could have picked a different and cheaper holiday. The assumption that my daughter is regularly being treated unfairly to her siblings is not accurate. When I was her age, I was already her father and working two jobs, happily, to provide a good quality of life for my daughter and her mother. I'm happy that my daughter's young adult life is more carefree than mine got to be. If she was struggling financially, or even just living on her own paying rent and bills, I would never ask her to pay this much for a trip. And yeah, I have weird feelings about my daughter's stepdad for always refusing to be the bad guy and let our daughter learn to be more responsible. You're the jerk. So you'll pay for the kids that have no bills, but not the adult who is just starting out and is struggling to get her crap together? Look, if she was spending that much of her own money, more than two months rent, to go on a vacation with her friends, it would be irresponsible. Why on earth is it okay for her to spend it to go with family? Most kids that age don't even really want to go on vacation with their parents and little siblings. You're the jerk. 22 is young to be funding an overseas trip. If she never got a trip when she was younger, you have the money now and you're paying for everyone else. Take the kid. My parents took my husband and I on a Mediterranean cruise in our late 20s because we never traveled growing up. They covered airfare and all of the fees. We only had to cover excursions and souvenirs. Do you want a family vacation or not? Um, you're the jerk. During the whole time she was growing up, she was unable to enjoy anything like this. The money wasn't there and she couldn't go. Now that the money is there, you're going to pay for everyone else to go, but you're going to expect her to pay for her own share of the vacation. Yeah, you're the jerk. I understand there was a conversation about it, but the fact that you would even have that expectation of her for something like this is pretty messed up. It's not like she's in her 30s with some great career. She's 22. At the very least, you can get over it and pay for one vacation for her. Well, what do you think? 
Is OP the jerk for asking his 22-year-old daughter to pay for her vacation or not? Please let us know. Reddit be like, they're 18, they're an adult, they can do what they want. But then Reddit be like, she's only 22, you should pay for her vacation. You want HR involved? Okay, sure. I work in radiology. About 15 years ago, I was working with a radiographer, x-ray tech, called Smith. Now, Smith had recently received two official warnings of duty, one for mistreating the boss and one for mistreating me. Smith was told to change their attitude and behave. Smith, however, went on a path of revenge that was endless. A thousand tiny paper cuts for me. Nothing terrible, but just lots of little things which I knew Smith had done but I couldn't prove. One Monday morning, one of the A&E doctors came over to complain about how poor the x-ray image quality was a couple of nights ago. Smith goes over the roster board and sees my name corresponding to that shift. You work this afternoon shift by yourself. Smith charges into the boss's office, demanding a full complaint process. Smith demands, since clearly the boss and I have it in for them, HR should run it independently. The boss tries to talk Smith out of it, but Smith basically says they don't trust the boss to deal with me fairly. The boss tells Smith he will hand it over, but be careful of what you ask for. Apparently, Smith was in quite a lather and so excited that they had got me. Two days later, I'm being interviewed by two HR guys and an independent chief radiographer from another hospital. We go through each of the images and I agree the work is really poor. It's clear no one has actually looked too carefully at the paperwork with the x-ray images. The HR guy finally asks, why did you do such poor work? I reply, I didn't. And if they bothered to look at the online pay system, I had called in sick that day. In fact, Smith had done the overtime shift. They looked stunned. I reminded them I expected the same process for Smith. I also lodged an official complaint about false allegations that were made by Smith for this case. Apparently, Smith tried to stick to the roster, but they showed Smith their pay slip, plus that they had signed off on all the other images. While HR was deciding what to do with Smith, fire them or not, Smith had two more incidents at work and was eventually fired. Edit to answer some of your questions. 1. When Smith got fired, HR went to town and dug up every little bit of dirt on him so they couldn't claim wrongful dismissal. My boss was well aware of who worked and was happy to deal with it, but Smith wanted HR. My boss was more than happy to see Smith dig themselves an almighty hole. Did Smith take bad x-rays on purpose? I don't think so. I think Smith's mental health was crashing at this point. The work reflected their mental health. I think Smith saw the complaint and was quite manic and thought that they'd get me. Smith simply had overlooked the overtime that they did. Unsuitable Background I'm in Australia. I'm currently a 32-year-old male and this occurred this year. I used to do admin work in defense and during that time I got rather qualified and experienced, specifically in people management and training people. I then left the uniform for various reasons, including depression caused by my time there. I got a new job and intentionally got a position way below my capabilities so I could focus on my mental health while still working. It was a hotline for a government assistance program. The position was good for about four years. Over that time, I started using some of my skills more and built up my confidence again. I also was acting in higher positions almost the entire time. Initiating Incident So after all of the lockdowns finally finished, there was a permanent spot and a higher position available. By this time, I was the longest serving person remaining in the team and I was the most qualified. I knew they planned on getting the incumbent to do two roles, both of which I knew thoroughly. Went through the interview process, answered all of the questions, explained how I could do the role immediately without training, etc. Had to wait a few weeks to find out the results since it's still government and they don't do these things super fast. Then I got told that I was found not suitable. I was floored. I asked for an explanation and all I was told is that it was a very competitive round. When I asked what I could have done to be more competitive, I got the same answer. To make things worse, they asked me to train the guy who got the role. Immediately I brought up the duty statement which had the list of tasks for my role. Remember, it's super easy. Basically just answer the phone and reply to emails. I also got out of public service level expectations and highlighted the appropriate bits for my level. Q Malicious Compliance Since I wasn't suitable to work at higher levels, I immediately stopped all work that wasn't at my level or in my job description. To say this put a dent into the extra work I was doing would be an understatement. 
I used to help out management with sorting out interpersonal disputes. I used to run a bunch of reports to find and sort out work that was missed, and I used to help the other teams do their work. So at this point, my days became super easy. I would do about 10% of what I used to, as that 10% was my actual job. The training I was doing was directing the guy to the procedures, and if he had questions, directing him to ask a supervisor. It was about a week of this before management noticed the training wasn't very in-depth. One by one, they asked me what was going on. Our structure had six supervisors at the time, each and every time I said the same thing. Unfortunately, I was found unsuitable for the role, so I can't teach someone how to do it. To say they were upset would be an understatement, but they tried to stay professional. They then started questioning why I stopped doing all the extra work that I had been doing for years. I directed their attention to my duty statement and asked where it lists that work. They said the extra duties as directed. I then asked how that aligns with the level expectations, which are surprisingly clear and helpful. At this point, most stopped trying. During all of this sudden free time I had, I started searching for a new job. It only took me two weeks to go for interviews, be found suitable, and got a new job. Apparently, I'm incredibly competitive at this level. Who knew? The fallout. The new job is significantly easier at the level I was unsuitable for and gives me much more money than they were offering. Additionally, I've kept in touch with some people there. The management are floundering as interpersonal problems are cropping up. The team can't keep up the workload and at least three more people have gotten new jobs with at least two looking for other employment, leaving one person left in the hotline team that will know what they're doing. It's a shame really because I liked that program and probably would have stayed for a long time. Am I the jerk for my response when my family asked me about having kids? I'm 22, female, and I come from a traditional family. By that, I mean every woman in my family had at least one kid before they were 20. Education was never a priority. Because of this, I have four younger siblings and about a dozen cousins. Being the oldest, I had to be a second mother to my siblings and a babysitter for my cousins. This made me realize I never wanted to be a parent myself back when I was only 10. 12 years later and my opinion hasn't changed. I don't like kids and I don't want any. Last year I had my tubes tied and I didn't tell my family. They're trying to push the idea that I'm nothing and my life is empty without me having any kids. I've made my point clear many times but they kept pushing it. Last night we had a big family dinner and they again tried convincing me to have kids so I shut down everything they said in a not so nice way. They were going on and on about how amazing being a mom is and how that's their biggest accomplishment. So I reminded them of all of the times they've complained about having to take care of the kids. All the times they would yell at us for doing kids stuff. All the times they would tell us how much they regret having us and how we ruin their lives. I reminded one of my aunts of all the times she would make 10 year old me take care of her four kids who were all under six just because she was bored and sick of taking care of them herself. I reminded my dad of all the times he complained about how much more money he had to spend on me and my siblings. And of course, I reminded them how they kicked us out at 18 because they don't have to care for us legally speaking. Then I just said something like, all my life you've done nothing but complain about having kids and now you're sitting here telling me how kids are the best thing in the world? You're all hypocrites. Then I told them not to call me unless they decide to apologize for berating me, and I left. They're all very mad at me, but my siblings and cousins say I should have made my point without making them feel like bad parents. So, am I the jerk? Update. My mom showed up at my apartment demanding that I make a formal apology to the family and went off on me for my behavior. Then she went on about how disappointed she is that she raised such a selfish excuse of a daughter. Then she left. So I sent the following message in the family group chat. I will not apologize for defending myself and standing my ground. I've put up with y'all for too long and I'm sick of having to justify my choices. I will live the way I see fit because it's my life. This so-called family never showed me any love or support. Even as a kid, I was just a free babysitter for your kids. I see you will never respect me or my decisions, so I don't see a reason for me to stay in contact with you. Do not contact me again. Oh, and by the way, I had my tubes tied a year ago. Goodbye. Then I blocked them all. Update 2. Mom showed up at my work because how dare I talk to my family that way and how dare I not give her grandkids. My boss had to call the police to have her removed because she was hysterical.
I'm going to stay with my BFF for a while. I'm looking for a new apartment and a new job. My landlord was very understanding and she offered to help me move my things into storage before the 15th of January. My lease ends January 7th. She said she won't charge me any rent if I can move out by the 15th. She's amazing. My boss was also very understanding and offered to help me look for another job. I'm going to see a lawyer tomorrow to get a restraining order against my family members. I don't work for you specifically. A couple of years back, I worked for a very large resort style place. It was where some very, very wealthy people had vacation homes. This place was huge as it was basically its own town and I happened to be in a small subsection of the largest apartment. Now, it's important to note that the uniforms my small team wore were completely different from the vast majority of people in this department because we were very specialized. We wore blue shirts and gray pants. Most of the rest of the department wore green shirts with khaki pants. Actually, I'm fairly certain that we were the only team other than the on-site EMTs who had blue uniforms. It was a big place, lots of employees, so most everyone in public-facing jobs were essentially color-coded. Anyways, it was literally my second to last day on the job and I had to go to the main office for the department because that's where we kept things that we didn't need all the time. Space was extremely limited in our office. I run inside, pick up the box that we need, and head back out to my vehicle. A lady who's wearing a green shirt walks up to me, and since I try to be a decent person, I smile and say hello. Lady. Oh, perfect. I need help taking a whole bunch of crap over to the banquet hall. Me, very clearly holding a heavy box that's labeled for my team. Uh, I'm on a tight schedule. Sorry. My team worked a very time-sensitive position. I'm talking down to the second sometimes. Lady. That can wait. I need help now. Me. I'm really sorry, but I need to get this to... I don't care. You need to help me. Me. Completely out of hoots to give. Not to be rude, but you aren't my supervisor, and my actual supervisor will tear me a new one if I don't get back to our office right now. Lady. I'm going to tell the head of the department about this. Me. Over my shoulder as I walk away. Go ahead. He's in his office right now. I just said hi to him. Anyways, I headed over to my office and pretty much forgot about the interaction because we were slammed that day and it was non-stop until we closed. The next day was my last day on the job, so I wasn't surprised to see the head of the department show up when my shift was almost over. He was a really good guy, one of the best upper management types I've ever met, and really made an effort to get to know everyone in his department. My supervisor and I greeted him and we chatted while I finished cleaning up my station. Department head, suddenly very grave. OP? I got a very concerning report about you yesterday. Me and my supervisor. What? Department head. Apparently, you refused to give assistance to this lady when she asked for it. Me. Oh yeah, I was bringing supplies from storage back here and didn't have time. She was kind of rude. Department head, grinning widely at his own joke. Well, in that case, I'm afraid that I'll have to let you go if you don't apologize to her. Me. I'm terribly sorry that it has to end this way, but I must stick to my principles. He laughed, shook my hand, and told me I could always count on him for a good reference while my supervisor cackled in the background. It wasn't a perfect job, but it was one of the better ones, and I'll always be a little sad that I had to move away. But at least it ended with a pretty good chuckle. Want me to come to class and present despite being ill? Okay. For context, this was before 2020, back in my early university years, aka 2018 to 2019. It started one Wednesday morning when I woke up feeling like complete and utter crap. This was a problem, as today I was scheduled to do my oral presentation along with other students in one of my classes, but I figured no way would I be wanting to come in sick. And by sick, when I looked in that mirror, I was so pale I looked dead. My nose looked like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. My eyes were so sunken in that they were in the back of my head, and I was sweating like heck from a high fever. Oh, and my throat felt like it was made of sandpaper. Yeah, no way was I going into the lecture hall looking like this. So I went through the normal procedures, submitting a temporary absent form, which meant for the absent to be valid, I needed to go to a walk-in clinic, joy, and call any professors or teachers' assistants to inform them of my absence. We have a lot of interactive stuff in lectures. That's also common courtesy, along with an email for a paper trail. My afternoon physics professor understood. My evening teaching assistant for earth sciences was cool with it. My morning chemistry professor? Either you stop lying and come in, 
Oh, it's an automatic zero. I'm sorry? I've never missed one of your classes, even with a minor cold. But this? Okay, fine then. So I get up and my mom drives me in, as I didn't have my license yet. Long story, and she wasn't working that day. She's self-employed. She's worried about me, but I reassured her that I would only be about 20 minutes max. I get to the campus and walk in, heading to my lecture hall, and of course, looking like utter crap, stumbling because I'm also running a really high fever. I get a lot of weird looks, and some students even stop me to ask if I was okay. I recall responding with something like, I won't be if I'm late for class. When I do get to my lecture hall, I enter two minutes late. Professor sees me and goes, OP, about time. Get down here and start your presentation or it's a fail. Alrighty. I went up, plugged in my laptop to the projector, and released an almighty round of wet coughing. Now, my lecture mates are whispering to each other and Professor looks at me startled. But all I remember doing is looking right at the professor, smiling and saying very hoarsely, Sorry, I'll get started. She quickly tried to send me on my way, but I say into the microphone, my voice sounding like a sick bear's, No, no, you said if I don't present, it's a zero. I can't fail 20% of my grade. So off I go, presenting with a hoarse voice, long, hacking, wet coughs, and with occasional almost throwing off. When I finished, I then turned to the professor and asked, again into the mic, Do you need me to stick around for the other presentations, or can I go? I was on my way to the doctor's within five minutes, and wouldn't you know, I had a serious case of the flu, something that the university did not want you to bring to campus because it could spread like wildfire. Needless to say, when I filed my full absence form with my doctor's note, I mentioned how my chemistry professor insisted upon me coming to class. I also included a screenshot of the email she sent me while I was being driven in, which stated the same thing she told me over the phone. When I was finally able to return to campus a week later, I was surprised to enter a class to see a substitute professor. I later looked at my email and saw a class notification that our original professor was placed on leave. She was let go by the end of the term. Support our channel by joining as a member today and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.